Romans chapter number 10. Please, book of Romans chapter number 10. And it's good to be in church on Sunday morning. And uh, nowhere I'd rather be than in church on Sunday morning. And I'm glad that you're here today, and I'm glad I know who Jesus is, aren't you? Oh, man. I'm glad it's not just the academic knowledge or a book knowledge or hearsay or secondhand information. I'm glad I know him personally. Amen. I'm praying God will meet with us this week, and I want God to manifest Himself. I believe that there's probably three, we can say three degrees or three, I would say three degrees to the presence of God. Number one, God is everywhere, right? He's omnipresent. God is everywhere. And number two, God is within the believer, isn't He? Once you're saved, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, so God is within you if you're saved. And then in revival, number three, I think we have the manifest presence of God, where God just shows himself real, tangibly in the, in the meeting in our life. And I'm praying that's the kind of meeting we have in these days, that God will just show himself mighty in our meeting. And I know he can, and I know he wants to, and I'm praying that God will meet with us. Romans chapter number 10, we'll read verse 9 down through verse number 13. And this morning, what I'm going to preach is probably the most basic, and I hope the most clear, Probably the most simple message that a preacher could preach. But I also say this, I believe it's probably the most important message that a preacher could preach. In fact, as I was preparing to preach this morning, I tried to talk God out of preaching this message. I thought, Lord, everybody knows that. They've heard that before. But without a doubt, I know this is the message God laid in my heart for, uh, this morning. And I found out it's better to obey God than to do what I want to do. Romans chapter number 10, let's read it, verse number 9. The Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to draw your attention to verse 13 where the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think according to this verse, the Bible tells us everyone can be saved. But not everybody is saved. I believe as I travel the country, a lot of the problems that we find in churches could be fixed if some folks were really just born again. Right. I believe that. I'm not talking about just praying a prayer or saying words, but I mean born again the Bible way, saved. And for just a little while this morning, I want to ask you a question, just as if you and I were talking. And I'm going to try to be as clear and simple and basic as possible. I want to ask you a question. Are you saved? I don't mean maybe, or you hope, or you think. But I mean, are you 100% sure that if you were to die today, heaven is your home? Amen. Are you saved? Amen. We want to have revival, but you can't have revival if you've not been given life in the first place. So I'm praying this morning, God will help us. And if you are saved, I'm praying this, God will give us a burden for our lost loved ones. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd speak to my heart, speak to the hearts of every man, every woman, every young person here today. And I pray most of all, Holy Spirit of God, that you would convict the sinner, God, of their lost condition, help them understand that there is a way to be saved. And I pray before we leave this property this morning, folks will be born again who need to be. Lord, there might be some here who wrestle with doubt, go back and forth. I pray they would just get that thing nailed down. For Christian folk, I pray you'd help us to have a burning zeal, a desire in our heart to see lost people saved. I pray for revival this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. On April 14, 1912, the Titanic struck an iceberg. The next day, the ship sunk. Now, at that time, the boat was the largest ship floating. In fact, they said the Titanic was an unsinkable vessel. The captain of the boat even went so far as to make the statement, not even God can sink this ship. Now we know, know what happened. On April 15th, the boat did sink, and over 1,500 people lost their lives when the Titanic went under. Several months after the boat had sunk, a man stood in a pulpit and gave a testimony. He'd been on board the boat with a preacher by the name of John Harper. The man stood in the pulpit, and he said, I was on the ship that night as the boat was sinking in the sea. 
He said, I watched as they lowered the lifeboats and ladies and children climbed in and men were throwing themselves overboard into the icy uh, Atlantic Ocean. He said, I could hear the crying and the screaming, the frantic voices of people as the boat was sinking. He said, I too threw myself into the sea and was floating there in the water. And a man in the distance was also there treading water and the waves were bringing us together. And he said, as the waves would draw us together, that man cried out to me over the sound of all the commotion. And he said, are you saved? He said, I cried back at first and said, no. And the voice came, came back and said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He said, the waves separated us for a time and then brought us back together. And again, that man cried, are you saved now? And he said, and I cried out, no. And again, he said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Over and over again, he said, the waves would separate us and bring us together. And the preacher cried, John Harper, are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? He said, then finally, I heard his voice no more. And he stood in that pulpit several months later and said, that night the preacher, John Harper, died in the ocean. But I'm here to testify and tell you I am John Harper's last convert. Because that night in the sea, I called upon the name of the Lord. And I was saved. The most important thing that pertains to every living person is the salvation of their soul. In fact, you'll never be confronted with anything more important than what I want to present you with today. It's more important than where you choose to go to college. It's more important than the career path you go down. It's more important than who you choose to marry. What the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord is so important. I want to ask you the question this morning. Are you saved? I'll say it again, not in I think so, not in I hope so, not in I maybe so. But I mean, you have an assurance in your soul that if you were to close your eyes in death at this moment, that heaven is waiting for you. This morning, you and I might not be floating on broken pieces of wreckage from a sinking vessel, but we're all living on borrowed time. And every lap that second hand makes around the face of the clock, we're that much closer to our own personal meeting with God. One day every atheist will stand before God. One day every Bible denier will stand before God. One day every man and woman and young person in this building and around the world will have their own personal meeting with the God of eternity. Now can I say that's a pretty big subject. We're not talking this morning about something that's only going to have ramifications that will last as long as you do. But we're talking about something that has ramifications that will live and last as long as God Himself shall live and last. A million years from now, you're not going to be concerned with what kind of clothes you wore or what kind of car you drove or how much money you made. But a million years from now, it will matter how you answer the question, Are you saved? Education might make you smarter, but education can't save your soul. Money might make you wealthy, but money cannot save your soul. Good deeds might give you a good testimony, but good deeds cannot save your soul. The Ten Commandments might help you live morally, but the Ten Commandments cannot get you to heaven. And every person in this place today has an eternal, never-dying, ever-living soul. And long after your body's placed in the ground, your soul will live somewhere for all eternity. In fact, can I tell you that all we have is a choice, and that choice is a choice between two eternities. That's all it is. But these two eternities are as different as night and day. They're as different as darkness and light. They're as different as death and life. And I'll say it again. A million years from now, that's all that's going to matter. How do you answer the question, are you saved? A mother was dying, and as she was on her deathbed, her children were passing by, and one by one she prayed with her children. She prayed with her daughters, and after she would pray, she'd look in their face and say, I'll see you soon. The next one would come by, and she'd pray and say, I'll see you soon. Finally, her last son began to pass by, and he wasn't a Christian. He lived a rebellious life, and as he prayed with his mother, she cried and ended her prayer and said, Son, goodbye. And he said, Mama, how come for me it was goodbye and everybody else see you soon? And she said, Because you're not a Christian. And if you don't get saved, she said, Son, I'll not see you again on the other side, so son, for you... It's goodbye. The Bible's clear. We sing the song that says when we all get to heaven. But the Bible's clear. Not everybody's going to go to heaven. I believe everybody can. But I don't believe everybody's going. 
You see, the same God that offers free grace to every individual also promises to judge those who refuse His grace and die in their sin. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, for not one that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You say, well, what about that hypothetical person in the middle of nowhere that's never got to hear the gospel? Well, I'd answer you in two ways. Number one, the Bible said in the book of Romans, the creation itself bears witness to their conscience and soul that there's a creator God, so that they're without excuse. And the second thing I would say is this. I would not concern myself with a hypothetical individual that may or may not have heard the gospel. I'd be more concerned with your soul and mine today because we have heard the gospel. The old poem says, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. For one day you'll be asking, what will he do with me? If we could see with God's eyes this morning and see just how close we are to death, can I say we wouldn't wait for an invitation or another opportunity, but we'd get that matter settled today. Can I say that God doesn't work by age? God works according to appointment. And the Bible said it's appointed and a man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. I was preaching in Georgia last year on the first of the year and a man got in his car on Saturday night. Good man, driving down the road to go to the grocery store for his family. He left his wife and children at home and as he drove down the highway in front of the church I was going to be preaching at, he dropped his phone in the floorboard of his car. He reached down to grab his phone and when he did, his car veered off the road into the ditch and his tire hit a culvert and it threw his car up into the sky and flipped it over and he landed upside down in his vehicle in the front yard of the church house and he died, went off into eternity from the front yard of the church house. Can I say that man did not leave that day thinking he'd never see his family again. He didn't get in the car thinking that that would be his last trip down the highway and soon he'd meet God. But can I say that's exactly how death comes to us all. I don't know how much longer we have, but I know we have today to get this matter settled with God. Amen. If you and I could see with God's eyes today, we'd see past all the false professions. You ever notice in this day and hour everybody says they're a Christian? You knock on every door in Gulfport, Mississippi, just about everybody says they're doing all right, they're doing their best, they think they're okay. Can I say it's one thing to profess and another thing to possess? Say amen right there. And it's not what you say. It's who lives on the inside that makes the difference. And people will say, well, I'm doing okay. I mean, the porn pusher, the pill, the, the dope dealer. I mean, these people who've never even darkened the door of a church house, never heard the gospel, don't know how to quote John 3. And they say, I'm doing all right. And when they tell you that, their own mind and conscience bears witness against them. They're not ready to meet God. Can I say if that's you this morning and you're banking your attorney on something you might have said or might not have said, I'd get that thing settled in a hurry. If we could see with God's eyes this morning and see just how bad hell is, we wouldn't wait for an invitation. We'd tear up the carpet, run into an old-fashioned altar, begging God to spare our soul. While you and I sit in an air-conditioned auditorium on a Sunday morning, there are literal people in a literal place called hell begging for a drop of water, burning in fire that never goes out, eternal torment without an end to it. Can I say, if you and I could see what God sees, we'd get this thing settled. I want to ask you the question. Are you saved? Amen. Plenty of good men will go to hell. Hello, plenty of good ladies will go to hell. Plenty of good teenagers will go to hell. On the flip side, let me say plenty of bad men will go to hell. Plenty of bad ladies and teenagers will go to hell. What we're talking about this morning is not good or bad. That's not dif what differentiates between heaven or hell. That's not what gets you in or what keeps you out. Can I say there'll be a lot of bad people who make it to heaven, just like there'll be a lot of bad or good people that go to hell. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not what makes the difference. You say, well, who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Here it is. Saved people go to heaven. Lost people go to hell. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you saved? They say one of the reasons so many people died on the sinking of the Titanic is the captain refused to lower the lifeboats until the water was up almost to his knees in his own office. He refused to believe that ship could sink. And as the water was rising, he was living in denial that the boat was going down. And so many people lost their lives because of it. But can I say people sit in church preacher and do the same thing every single week? They sit there and think, well, that's for somebody else. I've got forever to get this thing settled. That's not me. Maybe for somebody. And all the while, the water of God's judgment rises in their life. I want to ask you the question. Are you saved? If I could twist your arm and make you get saved, I'd do it. If I could pay you money to get saved, I'd do it. If I could get saved for you, I, could, I would do it. But can I say, I can't do it for you, nor could you do it for me. It's a personal decision between you and God. Amen. I don't know anybody here personally. 
But I know this, I don't want my worst enemy. I don't even think I have an enemy, but I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go to hell. I want to ask you a question. Are you saved? I'm not asking, are you religious? I'm asking, are you saved? I'm not asking, do you own a Bible? I'm asking, are you saved? Amen. I'm not asking, are you a Baptist? I'm asking, are you saved? I'm not asking, have you been to jail or gotten a speeding ticket? I'm asking, are you saved? I'm not asking, are you wearing a dress for a certain time? I'm asking, are you saved? Are you ready to stand before the one who knows you better than you know yourself? Are you ready to stand uh, in front of the God of all creation? Are you ready to give an account of yourself to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Are you ready to meet God? Are you saved? I can see in my mind as that giant ship is sinking. I can hear as the metal bends and the wood breaks and hear the cries of the babies and the screaming ladies dropping down in lifeboats and see the men as they plunge into the icy water. And over all of that commotion, over all of that scene comes the cry of the preacher with his final breaths on earth. And he says, Are you Saved. Let me give you a couple of statements to consider. Number one, there's a need for salvation that's universal. The Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The reason everybody can be saved is because everybody needs to be saved. The Bible declares that we all alike are sinners in need of salvation. Can I tell you this morning that a righteous God cannot dwell with sin? And just one sin is enough to separate you and I from God for all eternity. You say, but my sin's not that bad. Can I say that God's not concerned with how bad we think our sin is? One sin is enough to keep us from the presence of God for all eternity. This morning, not all of us here today are wealthy, but all of us are sinners. Not all of us might have a college education, but all of us are sinners. We might not all have a name known around the world, but all of us are sinners. We might not all be good at this or that, but all of us have one thing that we have in common, and that is that all of us are sinners. You say, well, I don't think I'm that bad. Can I say that's like that person in an orange jumpsuit sitting behind iron bars, already been condemned guilty by the judge, still saying, but I didn't do anything wrong. You see, I'm not asking for my opinion or your opinion. God's already rendered His opinion. And He says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. You've got to teach young people a lot of things, but you don't have to teach them how to sin. They get that naturally. You say, but it's just a bad temper, but God calls it sin. But it was just a bad word, but God calls it sin. But it was just one bad image I looked at and lust in my heart, that, that God calls it sin. But it was just a little bit of gossip, but God calls it sin. But I was just lying a little bit. God calls it sin. And we can try to change the terminology, but it doesn't change the fact. You can slap a Coca-Cola label on a bottle of poison, but if you drink it, it's going to kill you just the same. And you and I can try as hard as we want to do away with our own sin, but the Bible tells us there's nothing we can do to cover, atone, or take away our own sin. You could get baptized in every creek in the county. You could join every church, give money to every preacher. Can I say that wouldn't do a thing to take away your sin this morning? That's like a little boy who went and plucked a flower from a field and got mud on his hand. He came inside and gave the flower to his mom. And his mom said, what in the world did you do? He said, I got you a flower. She said, but you have mud all over your hand. He said, no problem. He took his clean hand and wiped off the mud from his dirty hand and said, there, I got rid of it. No, he didn't. He just transferred it somewhere else. And can I say... Adam fell in the Garden of Eden because of that sin has been passed to every single person. From the cutest little baby to the oldest lady in the building. Say amen right there. Amen. And everybody in between, all of us are sinners. And you'll find water on the sun before you'll find an unsaved sinner in heaven. It's impossible. Number one, there's a need for salvation that's universal. Number two, I like this one better. There's a way of salvation that is universal. The Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the, what's the next word? Lord shall be saved. You know, you might meet somebody and they might be sincere. And you say, how do I get to Temple Baptist Church in Gulfport, Mississippi? And they might meet it with all their heart. I mean, their grandpa believed it, their mama believed it, their preacher believed it. And they might believe it with all their heart. Sincerely say, take any road you want to, it'll get you there. I believe that long heart. You just get on any road. And if you really... Believe it. You're sincere about it. It'll get you to Temple Baptist Church in Gulfport, Mississippi. And they might believe it. They might be sincere, but they're wrong. 
And can I say, you might sincerely believe whatever you want to believe, but it's not what you believe or what I believe that makes the difference. It's what God says that makes the difference. And there's not many routes to heaven. There's not many ways to heaven. There's not many doors or tickets to heaven. There is one avenue to heaven. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus testified, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, doesn't matter, rich man, poor man, tall man, short man, white man, but it doesn't matter. No man comes under the Father but by me. You can go to heaven without money, but you can't go without Jesus. Right. You can go to heaven without a car, but you can't go without Jesus. You can go to heaven without a church membership card, but you can't get to heaven without Jesus. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. One way, Jesus is the way. A man was dying on his deathbed. He was searching the scripture. He never read the Bible in his life. And his friend said, what are you doing with that Bible? You don't even read that book. What are you doing? And frantically he looked through it and said, I'm trying to find a loophole. Can I say there are no loopholes? There's no back door. There's no side entrance. There is no a, a second route. There's only one way. And Jesus is the way. It's not good works. It's not baptism. It's not the way you dress. It's not the things you say. Jesus is the way to heaven. He's the way of salvation. Before you and I even drew breath, God planned a way that we could spend eternity with, uh, with Him. First Timothy 1.15 is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There's no Baptist way to heaven. Amen. There's no Methodist way to heaven. There's no Catholic way to heaven. There's no Pentecostal way to heaven. There's no Presbyterian way to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. That's the Bible way to heaven. And Jesus is the way to heaven. Amen. Calvary was God's response to our sin. The eternal one laying down his life for you and I doomed to damnation. If we had needed education, God would have sent us a professor. Say amen right there. If we would have needed technology, God would have sent us... A a techno an inventor. I mean, but what we needed was a Savior, so God sent us Jesus. He came to earth. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not of worse, lest any man should boast. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, made under the law to redeem them who were under the law. When I couldn't go to where He was, thank God, He came to me. And as Jesus died on the cross, He took my uh, sin upon Him, my judgment, my wrath that I deserve. Jesus bore it all. Died my death, rose from the grave, and now a sinner can get to heaven. How? Jesus spared the gall. Jesus opened the gate. Jesus made the way. You can't pay your way into heaven. You can't pry your way into heaven. The only way there is through Jesus. Amen. He's the way in Africa. He's the way in Antarctica. He's the way in Asia. He's the way in Australia. He's the way in America and even in the country of Alabama. Say amen right there. Jesus is the way. Money might buy you a bed, but listen, money can't give you sleep. Money might buy you books, but money can't buy you brains to understand them. Money might buy you food, but money can't buy you an appetite. Money might buy you medicine, but money might, but, but, but it can't buy you health. Money, can't, uh, money might buy you a house, but it can't make your house a home. And money might get you a ticket to anywhere in this world, but money can't get you to heaven. Only Jesus can get you to heaven. The thief on the cross, as he, as he was dying, he couldn't work for Jesus. His hands were fixed. Yeah. Couldn't walk for Jesus. His feet were fastened. Mm -hmm. Couldn't live for Jesus. His life was over. All he could do was take his faith, yeah. lay it on the man in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood yeah. of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. What makes a man a millionaire? Curse us, you say, a million dollars. What makes a man a Christian? Christ. Tom Brady can't pass his way into heaven. <coughs> Warren Buffett can't buy his way into heaven. Donald Trump can't legislate his way into heaven. And you and I can't get ourselves there any other way either outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, there's a need that's universal. Everybody needs to be saved. Number two, there's a way that's universal. Everybody gets saved the same way. Number three, there's an invitation the salvation, thank God, that's universal. The Bible said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, since this is a deep theological kind of church, I can get into the Greek language. You'll understand me, but I want to give you the Greek meaning of the word whosoever. You ready? Here's what it means, y'all. <laughs> and 
fact, let me give you the lesson in Kentucky version. It's plural, so it really means all y'all. <laughs> what he's saying is red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Doesn't matter who it is. The floodgate of salvation is colorblind and seven continents wide. And anybody breathing air could be born again if they wanted to. And don't get too excited about that or anything. But that tells me anybody that's here today, if you want to get saved, you can get saved. Hello, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you're from, who you are, doesn't matter your last name, your income bracket, educational level, doesn't matter what side of the track you live on, if you're breathing air, Jesus died for you. Say amen right there. Whosoever. This is a faithful saying. He said he came to save sinners, but he doesn't classify what kind. Any sinner will do. In fact, you find the Bible, all kinds of sinners came to Jesus, and if they came in earnest, they all looked the same way, and that's ready for heaven, born again. You might have wondered in this place thinking, I'm too bad, I'm too far gone, I'm too far down. Can I say that's not what the Bible says? My Bible says, for whosoever. If you were to follow me around for just a, a few weeks, maybe a couple months, and see some of the folks get saved, that get saved in our services, it convince you he'll save anybody. I've seen some crazy things happen. I was preaching in Alabama, and I saw a witch get saved. I'm talking about a real witch, not the normal Baptist kind. I mean a real witch. I like to see some of them get saved too. But a woman who was wrapped up in witchcraft. She came to church on Sunday morning and sat there in the front row. And she was wearing all black. Black hair, black clothes, black eyeliner, black, I mean, black everything. It looked like she was just ready for Halloween. And sat there on the front row and just stared at me while I'm preaching. I'm having flashbacks looking at some of y'all this morning. I just watched my gaze. But she just stared at me while I, just, just like that, sis. But anyway, just staring at me while I preach. She didn't move nothing. Gave the invitation. She just stood there. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was the song or just the Holy Spirit got hold of her. She broke. I mean, she just broke in that seat. The preacher's wife went to her and put her arm around her and began to talk to her. Next thing I knew, they were on the altar. And she lit that witch, that woman to Christ, that woman. Amen. That's a whosoever. That's Amen. a whosoever. Amen. I went back the next year, and a nice-looking lady, blonde hair, nice-looking church clothes, came up to me and said, Hey, Brother Cooper, I'm glad you're back again this year. And I said, I'm glad to be back. I said, I think, were you here last year? We met. She said, yeah, I was here last year. I said, I'm sorry. I don't remember. She said, I got saved. I said, I just don't remember. She goes, oh, you'll remember when I tell you. And it was that, that girl from the year before. He was like a whole new person. She was, by the way. Hello. I was preaching at a church, and as I was preaching, the youth pastor was in the sound booth. And during the message, he left the sound booth, came down the front, grabbed the preacher. They were on the altar, and I thought, what was going on? The preacher said, Brother well, Cooper, I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to make an announcement. He said, Pastor so-and-so just got saved. Amen. Hello. Hey, That's a whosoever. Yeah. I don't care who you are. I was preaching at a tent meeting in West Virginia, and a man came under the tent, came forward and got saved. And I said, what brought you here? He said, I was dropped off here in this town. He said, I hitchhiked over here. He said, I was planning to kill myself tonight. He told me where he's from in another county. He said, I left my wife and children. He said, I was going to kill myself here tonight. He said, I came in the tent. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, I got saved. Right. They took him back home. As far as I know, he's still there home now. Hey. Can I say, doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you're from, if you're breathing air, you can go to heaven if you want to. Right. Number one, now let me give my, close my message. There's a need that's universal. You need to be saved. I'm telling you, 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 you need to be saved if you've never been saved. You can be saved because Jesus died for your sin on the cross. Man. Number three, he extends the invitation to every person for whosoever. That means all we all could be saved. Yeah. But number four, while the way, the need, the invitation is universal, the decision is personal. Yeah, that's right. For whosoever. Now that opens it up to everybody, but it puts the responsibility upon you as an individual. Yeah. Everybody can be saved, but not everybody is saved. There has to be a time and point place in your life where you understand that you are the one this is talking about. That you're the one who's in need. That Jesus died not just for the sins of the world, but for your sins on the cross. And by faith, you say, Lord, I pray you forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior, take me to heaven. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, you're not saved by proxy. You say, what's that mean? You're not saved just because you sit in church. You're not saved just because your grandpa was a preacher. You're not going to go to heaven just because your mama taught Sunday school. But there has to be a decision point in your life where for yourself you decide that you're going to take Jesus. Yes. Hello. Amen. An invitation has been extended. 
but the decision is personal. If you go to hell today, it won't be because of your sins. By that I mean it won't be because you drink, do dope, cheat on your spouse, cuss like a sailor. That's not what I'm saying. Someone who's heard the gospel, if they go to hell, it's because they choose to. If I were to approach you on the street, sir, if it's just me and you talking, and I said, why do you want to go to hell? You'd say, I don't want to go to hell. Are you crazy? But in a setting like this where there's a lot of people the preacher will preach and we make the decision not to make a decision, and in essence what we're doing is casting our vote to go to hell if we're not saved. Yeah, right. A man named George Wilson, you've probably heard the illustration, robbed a mail car. And he was sentenced to be hung by the neck till dead in the 1800s. And uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, the president, some men went to him and said, President, would you pardon this man? Would you forgive him, pardon him? And he wrote a pardon for George Wilson saying he could go free. They took the pardon to George Wilson and said, Mr. Wilson, you don't have to die. The president's pardoned you. He said, I don't want it. I don't want it. They said, but you have to take it. If you don't take it, you're going to die. He said, I don't want it. They rushed that pardon to the chief justice. And said, Mr. Marshall, the president pardoned George Wilson so he doesn't have to die. And the chief justice said, did he accept the pardon? And they said, no, he rejected the pardon. They said, well, then he must die. He said, the power is not in the pardon. The power is in his acceptance of the pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. But the power is in your acceptance of it. Yeah. The book of Hebrews said the word of God didn't profit them. It wasn't mixed in faith and with faith and then there heard it. You've already used faith today. When you sat in your chair, you used faith. Amen. You didn't check the bolts, you just sat. When you got in your truck or car, you used faith. You didn't check the brake lines, you trusted them. Hello. When you get paid, you go to the bank and you use faith. You trust that bank's going to keep your money. All I'm asking you to do this morning is if you're not saved, just take your faith, what little bit you have, lay it in Jesus, just like you do the chair. A break line, Amen. a paycheck at a bank. Surely you can trust Jesus if you can trust those things. Amen. I want to ask you the question this morning. Are you saved? If this was your last day, are you ready to meet God? That's the most important thing I can think about preaching this morning. Not just an I hope so, not a maybe so, but an assurance in your soul. Amen. My wife was raised in a Christian home. Went to Christian school a lot of her life. I met her in my wildest year. She matured me. I thought, now that's the kind of girl I want to marry. She didn't do anything that I'd done. I hadn't been any places like I'd been. I lived in the world, wicked. We got married. I was preaching my first revival meeting. As I was on the altar leading a boy to Christ, I heard a woman behind me in North Carolina shout. In North Carolina, the women shout, you know. I heard a woman shout, and I turned around, and the preacher's wife was hugging my wife, and they were both weeping, and I looked at my wife and said, are you okay? She said, I, I just got saved. I started weeping and said, what do you mean you just got saved? I said, I'm saved because you were saved. I mean, I, what are you talking She said, I've been living a lie all these years. Right on the outside, wrong on the inside. Jesus in the head, but not in the heart. He said, I just got saved. Can I say, if that's you this morning, it'd be a great day to get saved. Let's bow our heads, please. Let's be real still so nobody's...